more perfect you, the pursuit of perfection in Christ. This is lesson number seven, fruit of the Holy Spirit, first part of this. So in the letter to the Galatians, Paul is dealing with false teachers who are perverting the gospel. They were trying to teach that in order to maintain one's perfect status with God, it was necessary to submit to a mix of rules and rituals that they, those teachers, imposed, and the main one being circumcision. And in his reply, Paul reaffirms that their perfect state, granted through God's grace and received by faith in Christ, that status is maintained by walking in the spirit, not by following made up religion, the made up religion rather of the false teachers. And so in order to identify the life and the experience of walking in the spirit, Paul describes what the opposite experience is like. So in our lesson last time, we reviewed the four groups of actions that are the result of walking not by the spirit, but walking by the flesh. And very briefly, just the groups. I'm not going to go through all the sins again. We did that last time. But he talks about sexual sins, spiritual blindness, a divisive spirit, and insobriety. Those were the four groups that he, uh, you know, he, he talked about. And I said last week, these were just a sampling of the type of sins that you know, uh, mark someone who is walking by the flesh. There are many, many more. So he gives examples of actions and attitudes in these four groups that define the unspiritual person. Now I also said that this list was not an exhaustive list of worldly and fleshly activities, <laughs> just a sampling. Now he says that these uh, actions and activities as well, and in the, in the verse he says, as well as things like these are indicators that no matter what a person says, they're not really walking in the spirit if they're walking in these type of activities. So once he's given the negative side, Paul will go on to give us another sampling. This time, however, it'll be of the things seen in one's life who actually does walk by the Spirit. So before we talk about the characteristics of one who walks in the Spirit, let's consider for a moment the first part of the sentence, the fruit of the Spirit, very important. We have to understand um, and realize that it is the fruit that comes from the Spirit. It's His fruit. It's something that He produces in the Christian. You might think, well, sure, that's, you know, that's evident, of course. But many people make the mistake. They begin to uh, describe in detail um, uh, the virtues of you know, love and joy and peace, and people go home thinking that they have some kind of homework to do in achieving these things on their own. Oh, these are the fruit of the Spirit. All right, I'm, I'm going to go home and I'm going to get me some of this. I'm going to do this. The attitude being, I, I want to walk in the spirit, so I better start producing some of this love, joy, and peace stuff. And they go about trying to produce this through self-will. As if these things were a diet of some kind and all we needed was self-discipline to achieve them. And I ask you, <laughs> how many of us have the self-discipline necessary to go on something as simple as a diet. You know? Those of us you know, who, who, who struggle with a little too much sugar in their system, you know, we have to cut down on the sugar. Doesn't it seem that somebody's offering you pie and ice cream at every turn in your life? And you don't say no every time, right? Oh, just a little, just a bit. So imagine, if we can't say no to ourselves you know, to, the, to the ice cream, imagine the type of discipline necessary to produce spiritual fruit. So Paul doesn't explain it here in you know, Galatians in detail, but how does the Holy Spirit produce the fruit of the Spirit in someone? How do these spiritual characteristics become a natural part of our character? Very briefly, this happens in the proportion that we submit our will to the will of the Spirit. This happens in proportion that we submit our will 
to His will. That's how you produce the fruit of the Spirit. So in verse 16, Paul says that the, those who walk by the Spirit will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So walking by the Spirit or being in the Spirit or submitting to the Spirit, all these terms are referring to the very same thing. We are living according to the Spirit's will. Now the virtues that Paul describes are the net result of continually submitting our will to the will of the Holy Spirit. You know, I am not shooting for love. Love, you know, love is, the, um, is the natural outcome of the thing I am shooting for. The thing that I am uh, trying to do is I'm trying to submit to the will of the Spirit. And if I do that, then that love and joy and peace, that'll be the product of that. But I don't go about trying, I'm trying to produce peace, I'm trying to produce love in myself. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to submit my will to the will of the Spirit. And if I do that, then these other things will be uh, produced in me. So how do we actually do that? You know, how do we actually submit to the will of the Spirit? And this is what our lesson is this morning. A couple of things we need to do. Number one, we submit to the word of the Spirit. God's word was given to man through the agency of the Holy Spirit, right? What does Peter say? For no prophecy, when he says prophecy, you know, a word coming from God, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of the human will. Nobody ever got up and said, you know, I believe I'm going to speak you know, I'm going to say something that God wants said. That's not the way that it works. He says, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. It's the Holy Spirit that moves men and women, we have those in the Bible as well, to speak from God. Interesting uh, that the verb here, moved in the Greek, the imagery is of a wind that is pushing a sailboat. You've got the boat, you've got the sail, but without the wind, it's the wind that moves the boat you know, from place to place. Now, the comparison here is a man has a voice and man has an intellect and man knows how to say words and so on and so forth, but it's the Spirit of God that moves some to speak directly from, from, from God. Okay? And so when we submit or obey God's word, we are in effect submitting to the Holy Spirit who gives us that word. Now submitting to the Holy Spirit or to His word requires us to do certain concrete acts. So let's drill down. How do I submit to the word? Well, you read it. <laughs> you read it, you've you got to take it in. Acts 17, 11, you know, what does Luke write? The Bereans were more noble, why? Because they searched the scriptures daily as a first step of knowing God's true will. Paul went and preached the gospel to them and, and Luke writes that the Bereans were more noble than who? Well, than the Thessalonians and others that had you know, attacked Paul and he says, why were they more noble? Because they searched the scriptures daily. They heard Paul and they searched the scriptures to test what he said against uh, the scriptures. You know that, why do you think we promote regular Bible reading? If you've never noticed, you know, in the card, the little white card, you fill out your attendance at the top, RBR, regular Bible reader. Someone says, well, why don't you put daily Bible reader? Because that's too daunting for some folks. I got to read my Bible every day. Oh no, I, I was sick. I had the flu, I had to go to the hospital. My wife had a baby. I didn't, uh, you know, for four days I didn't read my Bible. So on day number five, I got to make up all that time. If I'm going to be a daily Bible reader, I, I've got to do it perfectly. So I'm starting to sound like Jerry Seinfeld as I get older. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? If you say daily Bible reader, some people, you know, they just take that literally and they get all, so we, we put regular Bible reader. I read my Bible regularly, three days out of five, four days out of seven, you know. I've learned through experience that if you become a regular Bible reader, it's only a matter of time that you become a daily Bible reader. So how do we submit to the word, to the Spirit's word? Well, you've got to take it in. 
You don't have to, you don't have to study it and figure out all the Greek, just read it. Just read it. You know, in the, daily, the regular Bible readers in the corner there, when we total them up, never more than 75 people ever check off that they're daily Bible readers. We've got more than 400 people here. Another way, thinking and meditating on God's word. My eyes anticipate the night watches, David says, that I may meditate on your word. Have we ever thought of thinking and focusing our minds on God's word during our quiet moments? Instead of reviewing past mistakes or worrying about tomorrow's problems? Wouldn't it be better if we just you know, open the Open the book, look at a passage, try to memorize it, think about it, focus on it, instead of churning out, you know, oh, what I did in the past, that's terrible, you know, or oh, in the future, what's going to happen? You know? Those two activities produce nothing, zero. They're worthless. But spending the same amount of time meditating on God's word is quite profitable. You know, we wonder why we, we don't know what God wants or why we keep making the same mistakes or why we're emotionally or spiritually exhausted at times. Could it be that it's because we rarely allow our minds the opportunity to rest and simply contemplate God's presence and His person by focusing on a portion of His word? I'm doing an interesting thing, well for me anyways, um, uh, you know, we know that we, we come from Quebec, our family comes from Quebec and I, we speak French. <clears throat> but I'd never read the Bible in French. I always went to English school, English university. And you know, uh, in my own regular Bible reading, I just read different versions of the Bible. One time I'll read, I'll read the King James Version through and then I'll, I'll read the New International Version through and then I'll read the New American Standard Version through and I'll, you know, all the different versions because they kind of give you a little different perspective. And it dawned on me, you know what, you never read it in French. And so I started reading the Bible in French, actually listening to it in French while reading it. And I was amazed at the things that I hadn't seen while reading it in English, because in reading it in another language, other things kind of popped out. Well, very rewarding, and I encourage you. you know, take, take, take the time to read different versions. It'll keep you fresh. So when we think and meditate on the word, it's, 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 a, it's an exercise in submission. When we stop all the traffic of our minds and redirect it towards God. Since He reveals Himself in His word, the focusing of our thoughts on His word is to focus on Him and thus lay our hearts open to the Holy Spirit. Turn off the TV, Click off the tablet and the phone, go into your private place and direct your mind towards His word and you will assume the proper position of humility that constitutes a submissive spirit. I mean, I confess, we're the same, we're all the same. While I'm doing my Bible reading, I can, I can actually feel my flesh, I can't wait to get to my newspaper. I've decided to read three or four chapters today, you know, and I'm at chapter two and it's a very long chapter. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm anxious to get to the headline news. What has Mr. Trump done today? <laughs> That's the flesh. It doesn't want to submit itself and read God's. It doesn't want, it doesn't matter, 10 years, 40 years, 50 years. There's always something else that you might rather be doing, the chores, the shop, the fix the car, whatever. That's why it's a position of submission, because it, it goes contrary to what the flesh wants to do. The flesh wants to do anything else but focus on God's word. Another thing that we can do to submit to the Holy Spirit Receive instruction from His word. You know, in Acts 2.42, right? It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Those who were baptized, the 3,000 who were baptized, Pentecost Sunday. They devoted themselves. That Greek word, they're devoted. 
Imagine if you're in a storm, and I'll use my sailboat you know, uh, imagery. You're in a sailboat and you're in a violent storm on sea. And the mast is ripped and the ship is going all over the place. Where are you going to be? I don't know about you, but I will be devoted to the main sail post there and I will have my arms and legs wrapped around that thing. So that word devoted there, you know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's an easy word. Well, no, it's a much more strong word. They clung to it for dear life. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. How can you submit, truly submit to someone if you don't know them, if you don't know what they want? The only way to truly walk in the Spirit is to know the way that the Spirit walks. And the only way to know this is to know His word. So the grace of God in Christ not only saves me, but it gives me a hunger to do what God wants me to do. And what God wants me to do is to submit or walk in the Spirit, and the only way to begin satisfying that hunger and His will is to grow in my understanding of the Spirit's way of living. And that knowledge is acquired in the same way that most knowledge is acquired, through instruction. Anybody here, anybody here want to be a doctor? Yeah, you don't go online and get you, you know, for $100 you get yourself a diploma. You have to study, you have to work. If you want to be an engineer or a teacher or anything, accountant, uh, security, you work in public security, a firefighter, you have to learn how to do that work. What makes us think that we don't have to learn how to do the walking of the Spirit? It's the same way. Every time you come to Bible class on Sunday or Wednesday or a retreat or a seminar, you are expanding your ability to walk by the Spirit. It's no secret that those who are more careful and committed to Bible class as a top priority reap the benefits of a closer walk with the Spirit as an end result. It's not playing favorites. Like anything else in school, the, 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 the guy or the gal that shows up to class and does the homework is going to get a good grade on the, you know, on the exam. And of course, the most obvious way of all to submit to the Spirit, we do what the Spirit says. Matthew 7, 21, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In this passage, Jesus acknowledges that the, the, there will be many who have read and understood and professed to believe the word of the Spirit, but they fall short because they don't do it. They don't do it. In that group falls those who know what they should be doing, but for some reason or other, they put it off to some other time. You know, I should be more involved, or I should give up this sin, or I should be more faithful, or I should be growing in the spirit, but you know, it's always manana, tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow. True submission doesn't take place unless our will, which is reflected by our actions, not our intentions, is submitted in obedience to the will of the Spirit, which will be reflected by the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, that's an iron cast law, spiritual law. There's, there's no other way to produce the fruit of the Spirit unless we submit to the Spirit. So to go back to our main point, how do we go about submitting or walking to the Spirit? Or by the Spirit, excuse me. So the first way to do it is by submitting to His Word by reading it, meditating on it, learning it, doing what it says. Now the next two ways to submit to the Holy Spirit are not so, you know, not so cut and dry, a little more difficult to explain and practice, but we submit to the Spirit when we submit to the power of the Holy Spirit. If you look at the Bible as a whole, you will see that each member of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, each member of the Godhead are at the same time equal but distinct divine beings in one God. I believe that that distinction is clearly seen in the role that each plays in accomplishing the salvation of mankind. 
So if someone says you know, there's three persons in, in God, okay, the, they call it the Trinity, the word doesn't, the Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but we refer to that as the Trinity. Three persons in the Godhead, distinct persons, you know, and it's, it's hard to get our minds wrapped around that. Well, a way to, to get our minds around that is to understand that we can tell the difference between the three by how they act in the accomplishing of our salvation. That's how we can tell the difference. Okay? All of them work in concert, but they are visible to us in different ways in relation to our salvation. Let me try to explain. In very general terms, we can describe their roles in the following way. The Father, God the Father, is the establisher. The world is established by His command. He establishes what is right and wrong, what is permitted, what is forbidden, what is law. We see that, right? Yeah, you can eat this fruit and that fruit, but you can't eat that fruit. The Father is the establisher of the rules. He establishes the terms. He establishes the method and the person who will bring salvation. Jesus didn't choose Himself. It says the Father chose Him. Jesus Himself says the Father chose me. The Father sent me. The Father establishes the time for the beginning and the time for the end, as well as the condition for salvation. That's the Father. In the beginning it was God the Father who spoke the world into being, and in the end, when all is completed, Jesus will subject all things, what? Back to God the Father, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. So the Father is the establisher. The Son is the embodiment. The Father willed the world and the Son embodied that will in the command to bring forth the universe and mankind. And after man fell into sin, the Father promised a Redeemer, and the Redeemer was embodied in the person of Christ, the Son of God. The Son embodies the perfect will of God the Father, whether He does so in the form of His word, in the form of His Son, in the form of His church, or in the form of His heavenly kingdom. Paul says that He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. He's the embodiment. Colossians 1.17. So every perfect thing established by the Father has its perfect essential form in Christ. For example, we see the universe, but the sun is the essence of God's will that established the universe. We see the prophecies and the law and the gospel, but the sun is the essence of God's will in speaking it. We see Jesus of Nazareth, but the sun is the essence of God's will in sending the Messiah. We see the church, but the Son is the essence of God's will in establishing an earthly kingdom called the church. We see the promise of heaven after death, but the Son is the essence of God's will for the consummation of the ages in eternity. He holds everything together. And so the Son is God's link to the human dimension. We see Him in and through and over everything that exists. God only sees the Son. So we have the establisher, the Father, the embodiment or the essence, the Son, and we have the enabler, the Holy Spirit. When the world was established by the Father through the embodiment of His Word in the Son, it was the Holy Spirit that the Bible says moved or hovered over the void, over the emptiness. That Hebrew word there, to vibrate. And the Spirit hovered over, He was over the darkness. Again, the Hebrew word vibrate. 
waves. You ever study sound waves, light waves? The Holy Spirit translated God's word and command into the physical action that brought forth the creation. And it is He that sustains the universe. This idea that oh, if we don't stop, we're going we're to destroy the earth. Man does not have the power to destroy the earth because he does not have the authority to destroy the earth. Obviously, we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the earth, to care for the earth, of course. And in that sense, those who um, strive to you know, to maintain a clean environment, you know, I agree with them from that perspective, absolutely. But even if all the men in the world got together and decided all together we're going to destroy the earth, they couldn't do it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit that, that sustains the creation. It is through the work of the Spirit that God's specific will embodied in His word is actually carried out. You know, when we speak of the providence of God, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we say it differently nowadays, we say, man, that was a God thing. That was a God thing. What we're saying is the Holy Spirit was at work. The providence of God was at work. That's the Holy Spirit. Miracles are carried out by the Spirit's power. Prophets speak according to His leading. Mary became pregnant by His agency. Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul says in Romans 8 verse 18. And that same Holy Spirit will also raise us from the dead. Isn't that what he says in Romans 8? If the Spirit in you is the same as the Spirit who raised Christ, that same Spirit will raise up your dead body? You know, in Acts 38, we, we kind of blow off the idea at times, you know, well, you know, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, though, and so we're Christians and we say, okay, I have the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in me, yes, so what? I, I don't feel anything. I'm out of the water, I was baptized last year. What's, What's he going to do for me? Well, he's going to raise you from the dead. That's what he's going to do. Aside from whatever work he does in your life while you're alive, in the end, it's by the Spirit's power that you will raise from the dead. It is the Holy Spirit that bestows gifts on the church and comforts the saints when in need. In Romans 8, 28, <clears throat> Paul says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. This is a very mangled verse, not by Paul, but by us at times. Because we take this verse to mean that if we win you know, the domino tournament, you know, God was on our side, you know, wow, working things out. If we get a deal on a house or something, oh, God was on our side, you know, all things work for good, you know, spirit. In other words, when something good happens to us, it's because God is working out things for our good. Well, I don't say no to that. You know, we pray, God help me do this, help me you know, succeed in my work, help me get a good deal, whatever, yeah, sure. But in this passage, the good he's talking about is the salvation of souls. <laughs> Everything works to the good of saving your soul. The Holy Spirit works all things together for what purpose? For your ultimate good so that you will come face to face with the gospel and hopefully obey that gospel. That's the good. What good is it if you've got 15 cars and 10 houses but lose your soul? That's, you know, what good is that? So the good here, especially if you take the whole passage in context, is the salvation of, of, and the preservation of our souls. Everything is working you know, for that purpose, to keep us safe, to get us saved and to keep us safe. God works in our lives with the purpose of bringing us to Christ and maintaining our faith and spreading that faith. 
In Acts 16, 7, Paul, you know, we read that he wanted to go preach. <coughs> Excuse me. He wanted to go east and go towards Asia and preach there. But the Bible says that the Spirit of Christ prevented him. Well, how? I mean, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, how did he prevent him? He doesn't give us any information. I don't know, maybe the river was overflowing that they had to cross, or the bridge was out, or they had no money, or they had no guides, or somebody got sick, I don't know. The Spirit wanted him to go west, not east, because this was in line with his plan for good. The Holy Spirit works events and forces in this world to pursue his goal of spreading the gospel and protecting the church and preparing for the return of Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. All things work for that good. Okay. So this means that we should be sensitive to the circumstances of our lives for uh, you know, these two powers are working. One is the influence of Satan and one is the power of the Holy Spirit. We can tell the difference when we observe the direction of the events and opportunities and circumstances in our lives, which way are they moving us? Is it really a God thing that you, you, know, you hit the jackpot somewhere and boy, it must be a God thing. You know, I, I was at the Lucky Star Casino and I, I hit the jackpot, you know, $48,000. Man, that's a God thing. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> that's not a God thing. If the circumstances work together to lead us further into the world, further from Christ, further away from the church, believe me, they're not from God. If they open doors for new opportunities for service, for growth, for knowledge, then you can know that the Holy Spirit is working for good in your life. And so submit to the working of the Spirit in your life and the product of the Spirit will be seen in you. All right, so a final way to submit to the Spirit in an effort to walk in the Spirit, we said submit to the Spirit's word, submit to the Spirit's power, and then the third thing, submit to the discipline of the Spirit. Let's read Hebrews. It says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him, for those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So the third way, to you know, walk by the Spirit, submit to the discipline of the Spirit. God disciplines us through the work of the Holy Spirit in engineering these things for our good. It could be through various trials that we suffer, according to James 1, 2 to 4. It could be through the correction of the church in some way. You know, Jesus said, if your brother sins, go see your brother, or in 1 Corinthians, the discipline of someone who was not acting properly, maybe that's the discipline that you're getting. It could be through a period of spiritual dryness that we encounter. You know, Jesus was in the desert. It could be the overwhelming amount of discouragement in ministry. You know, Paul was encouraged by the Lord as he stood trial before the Jews. I'm not saying that God creates bad things and sends the Holy Spirit to put them in our lives. God does not sin, nor does He tempt anyone to sin, nor does He draw anyone towards evil. But through the Holy Spirit, He does allow us to suffer trials and setbacks and discouragement and sorrows in order to teach us and strengthen us. The Holy Spirit is the one who sees us through these things. He's the one who mentors our progress, comforts our anxieties and doubts. He even brings our groanings and supplications to heaven in prayer before God. And some people, they fight Him. They refuse to acknowledge Him. They refuse to accept the situation that they're in. Yeah, no problem. You know. They continually cry out only for relief instead of insight. 
you're going through a difficult moment in your life, whatever it is, family crisis, financial health, whatever, most people will cry out for relief and that's okay, of course. But it's all right to also cry out for insight. What are you telling me, Lord? What can I learn, Lord? Some people just bear down and endure without any reference to God so they can confirm their disbelief and independence. Was it the atheist writer Christopher Hitchens? I believe he, um, he had written in his will, he had cancer and he was dying and he had written in his will that if he gets delirious and starts calling out to God or for some you know, religious person to come and pray for him, to not listen to him. He wrote this down in his will, you must not. If, I, if I'm in delirium of pain and I'm saying, God, please help me or you know, pray for me. No, don't do it. Know that, that that's just delirium. He wanted to be an atheist right to his dying, right to his dying breath. Some people are like that. Some people refuse to make the changes or change the course that the situation requires. No change, no repentance, no submission. It's going to be my way all the way. And yet, when we do submit to the discipline of God administered by the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves more in line with the Spirit's will and purpose for our lives and we begin producing that fruit that Paul talks about in chapter five. And so to, to summarize, before we talk about the nature of the fruit that comes from walking in the Spirit, we must first identify what walking in the Spirit consists of. If we know how to walk in the Spirit, then the product of that experience will come forth freely because we cannot produce spiritual fruit through human wisdom or will. I've said that to the degree that you walk in the Spirit, you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. We walk in or by the Spirit in three ways, just a quick review. By submitting to the word of the Spirit, we read, we think, we study, we do what the word says. We submit to the power of the Spirit. In other words, we allow the Spirit to guide our way. And we submit to the discipline of the Spirit. We subject ourselves to His correction and His building up. You know, most people are not fully aware of what a great thing is taking place in the waters of baptism. The Jews, they were familiar with baptism and its use as a purifying symbol so that a baptism to remove sins was not a new idea for them. I mean, you know, their priests and the Levites and those who served in the temple had to purify themselves with water and even there were several purification rites with water. So they, they got the connection between water symbolically and spiritual cleansing. So when Peter got up you know, on Pentecost Sunday and said repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, that, that made perfect sense to them. They, they understood the connection between, between the two. Okay. But that each of them would personally receive the Holy Spirit, that was news. This was fantastic because this blessing had only been reserved for prophets and kings in the past. Only the kings had the spirit come on them for a time so that they could be good rulers like David. Only the prophets could say, the spirit was upon me and you know, speak the word of God. Only the judges you know, like Samson and Samuel, only they had the spirit for a time in order to lead the people. But the promise the promise was when the Messiah comes, everybody's going to have the Spirit, old and young, rich and poor, educated, not educated. Every single person is going to have the Spirit and not just for a time. Everybody's going to have the Spirit living in them permanently. So when Peter gets up on Pentecost Sunday and announces this, you and I, we see the baptism part. But those Jews, they saw the, what? The Holy Spirit, I'll I will receive the Spirit. He quotes Joel there. 
And that's why he quotes Joel, because the prophet Joel is one of the prophets that said, when the Messiah comes, everybody's going to get the Spirit. So as it was then, it is today. Those who are baptized in the name of Christ receive forgiveness of sins, yes, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so through the Spirit's power in our Christian lives, we will grow into the knowledge of God's word. We will understand God's will for our lives and God's way for us to walk before Him. And if we submit to Him in these things, He will produce the fruit with the Spirit as a result. All right, next time we get together, we will drill down finally on the passage where he talks about the Spirit. We'll kind of you know, open that up a little bit for investigation. All right, thank you for your attention.